I love you. Please be seated. I, um, before I speak, I brought a gift for Chris uh, that I want to give him. And I wanted to give, I, there's a reason I want to give it to him in front of you. Uh, there's an honor thing that I want to uh, attach to it in a moment. But, but I'm very excited because I love giving gifts. This is one of my very favorite things. In fact, when I, when I get a gift for anybody, a family member, Margaret went for birthday, I, I never can wait until the proper day. In fact, when I come home, Margaret will say, you bought me something, didn't you? And I said, I did, and, and would you open it right now? And, 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 if, and she makes me wait for Christmas for the kids and the grandkids, but while they're opening the gift, I have to tell them what it is. And, and so, so I just, I, it's just, I'm sorry. It's, a, it's one of my many issues. So I got your gift, so I want you to open up right now. And, and I, I, I got the gift for a reason the other day, Chris, when I was thinking about you and, and who you are and, and what you mean to not only me, but all these people here and, and people around the world. And, and you already know me well, so you, you know what I got you. I got you a Mont Blanc pin. See, I couldn't wait to eat. There, I always, <laughs> I, I was just, you're slow, Chris. I'm you're sorry. just slow. <laughs> Honest to God, you're just slow. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a beautiful, John F. Kennedy, Mont Blanc pen, limited edition. And I, and I love you, I love you, okay? I just love you, I love you, okay? Yeah, yeah. Now, right, yeah. take all the stuff. And, 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 and by the way, Chris, there's a, there's a reason I, I gave you that pen. So just give me uh, 90 seconds and then we'll get on with the business. The, the, the first reason I got you the John Kennedy pin was because John Kennedy really empowered the younger generation when he was president. When, when you think of what he said in his speech, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. He said uh, every student, every, every young person has a change the world speech inside of them. And he was one who challenged kids all over the world, but starting in America to begin Peace Corps. And, and he had such a vision for empowering kids and understanding what they could do and their potential. And he was greatly loved by the young generation because of that. And I gave you that pin because you just talked about Highlands College and you are in the Christian world, the John F. Kennedy of, of empowering kids to make a difference in their world. And I just wanna, yeah, yeah, I just wanna thank you for that, okay? And if I could take personal liberty for just a moment when he talked about scholarships, I, it is my joy, Margaret's joy, our family's joy too. We, we've, we've, uh, we've given him a couple of scholarships or the school already. I, I put a, 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 a so gave him some money for my father for evangelism chair. Uh, uh, one for myself and a leadership chair, but, but, but then just, I just love giving to this school because it's going to be like no other Christian organization, higher education in the world, trust me. There, this is gonna be an academy sense that is going to bring out the very best in people and call the best of people to come and be a part of it. And I just want, when, 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 last year was a very difficult year for all of us, and, and with so much of the racial tension and division, for me, I just felt God said to, that I needed the scholarship of, of, of an African-American student to the school. And, and so I'm going to give $150,000 for that. And, and I just, I, I, I'm saying that to you because you, could, you, can scholarship, you can scholarship, you can scholarship one of the students in your, one of the kids in your church. And, and literally give it to Highlands College. And, and what's beautiful with the 150,000, my understanding is it's in perpetuity. It just continues on so that you're just doing student after student. And so I just want to challenge you. I just want to challenge you. One of my greatest giving joys is giving to Highlands College and being a part and, 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 and helping whatever way I can help, Chris. And, and so that's the first reason I gave you the pin. The second reason I gave you the pin was because John F. Kennedy said in, in this generation, we're gonna put a man on the moon. And he was a man of great vision. And when he said that, it wasn't even possible to put a man on the moon. We didn't have the technology, but he was such a leader that stepped out in great boldness and said, no, this is, we have the capacity. We're gonna, we're gonna do this in 1969. That's exactly what happened. And I gave you that pin because 
you're uh, such an incredible man of vision. A a and again, you're helping the Christian world, Chris, really see the possibilities. And so I want you to have that pen. The third reason I want you to have a pen is because you, you wrote another book. And, and thank God, you're getting better. <laughs> the only thing is, it's just your fifth book or fourth? Fifth, that's what, it's your fifth book. And, and the only, you're getting, you, it took me seven books before I really felt I got it. And you got it a lot quicker than, than I got it, but of course you should, I've been your mentor, good Lord. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I've been waiting, waiting, come on, you can do it, you can do it. And, and by the way, Out of the Cave, I hope you have it. I'm telling you, it's an incredible book. I'm so proud of you. And I gave you a pen because I collect Mont Blanc pens because I like to write a little bit myself. And, and oh, what's so funny is I, those are wonderful pens that I write really with a four color pen that's for 89 cents. It's a, I literally, I, that's what I use all the time for my writing. But I wanted to, I, so those are the three reasons I wanted to give you the, the pen and tell you on behalf of everybody here, everybody that's watching the other campuses, on behalf of everybody, Chris, you are our leader. And we are so grateful. We're so grateful. Just so grateful. Yeah. And what a, what a beautiful person he is. And he married so far above himself. Oh, dear God. He outputted his comfort, that's for sure. Okay. I, I want to talk to you uh, about a message the Lord has laid in his heart. In fact, Mark, uh, when Chris talked about burden to, today, just briefly, I, 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 I know what that's like to carry weight for others. And I have a lesson, a teaching um, that'll be a little different than what I normally would give you and, and it'll have a little bit more reading than I would normally give you. But it's just something that I have felt for the last, uh, oh, I don't know, 45 days as I prepared for our time together that God would want me to share. And, and I just want to talk to you on the subject, live well so you can finish well. And uh, the, the essence of the message and foundation is literally a year ago in 2020, on July the 4th, my father died. He passed away, he was 98. And um, on July 1st, I had a uh, I had a very special time with him three days before he passed away. We knew that we knew it was only a matter of hours or days. And so for four hours, I, I went into uh, his room, just the two of us, and he was unable to respond at all at this point of his um, health. And I sat down and I, I began to share with him the lessons that he had taught me. And, and what I would do is I would, I would share a lesson and, and then I would, um, and I would tell him where I learned that lesson and, and how he helped me with it. And then I would get up and I would go over to his bed and I would kiss him on the cheek. And I'd sit back down and I would um, share another lesson that he had taught me. And then I would get up and I would hold his hand, and maybe kiss his hand, and sit down and I would talk about another lesson that he had taught me. I was incredibly blessed. I truly won the parent lottery. And, and, and for four hours, it was just the two of us, and I was able to share 29 lessons, life lessons, life-changing lessons. In fact, when I finished and I had the privilege, of course, of officiating his service, and, and then literally uh, I, I, did, I did four weeks of, of teaching on lessons that my father taught me. And if you just go to johnmaxwell.com, it's totally free, and look slash, forward slash Melvin. Or if you just go to the podcast and look at Melvin, you'll, you'll, you'll find those lessons if you, if, you, if you would like to hear them. But the reason I just use him as an introduction is that um, my father finished well because he lived well. Um, he was really bigger on the inside than he was on the outside, and what he said to me was important, but as I went through those 29 lessons, what he lived in front of me was even more important. It, had, it even had greater weight than his words, and, and basically his, his life underlined everything that he said, and, and my teaching tonight with you, this is kind of like a father message, 
Or at my age, for some of you, it's a grandfather message. But this is a message just from my heart to yours. And, and you know, every year I ask God for a word, and, and, and he gives me a word every year. But a few years ago, he gave me the word father, and that's kind of been, he said, you know, I'll, I'll keep giving you fresh words, but, but you're going to be a now a father. And, and I began to write down what it means to be a father. And, and to me, it means that, that if, if I'm a father, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to empower you, especially as leaders that I'm going to unconditionally love you and that I'm going to revel in your success, that I'm going to take great joy in, 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 in the things that, that you do really well and, and I'm going to obviously birth spiritual babies. That's what fathers would, would do. And, and, and then I'm going to provide fatherly counsel. And, and what I'm giving you uh, to, tonight is fatherly counsel. And, it's, it's, and, and take it in the spirit that I'm giving it in, in a great spirit of encouragement when we got ready to launch my uh, last book, Change Your World, we had a transformathon because it's all about transformation. And it was really around the world. And we did a 5K walk in the morning and a 5K walk in the afternoon. And tens of thousands of people joined us on that walk. And it was a, it was a, it was a wonderful experience. But as I would finish the, the, the 5Ks and I would, I would lead them and, and, we, were, and we, we had some great, not only walking time, but just great encouragement, lifting time. When I got to the finish line, I stopped, and they were expecting, of course, because I led it to cross the finish line first, and I turned around and said, no, I, I want to cross the finish line last. I want to stand by the finish line. I want to cheer you on as you cross over. I want to, I want to see you cross over. And, and so they're crossing over, and I, I'm giving them high fives, and I'm encouraging them. And that's the spirit of this lesson tonight. This lesson is, I, I want you to really finish well, and I want you to understand that finishing well is determined by you today. It's not determined by you when you get a certain age and, and get a certain maturity and perhaps have had 30, 40 years of experience under your belt. It's, it, it, it's, it, it's determined by you at, at this moment. And I just want that for you very much. And we've just come through a very difficult time with COVID and I, I don't want to spend much time at all. We, we all understand what's happened. I just want to make three very quick comments. Number one is, because of this crisis, because of COVID, everybody moved. Everybody was moved because that's what a crisis does. It moves us. It takes us out of our comfort zone. It takes us away from what we have always known or what we have always embraced in our life. And, 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 and so the question is not where you moved in the last 16, 18 months. The question is, did you move forward or did you move backward? Did, did you... Did you did you swim upstream and improve your life or did you drift? And by the way, if you drifted, we never drift to a desired location. No one ever drifted their way to success. But we were all moved. And what happened was the crisis took us out of automatic. We all love automatic because automatic just we, we live in an automatic world and, and we don't have to really think too much and, and automatic is, is, is predictable, automatic is easy, automatic is comfortable. We, we, just, we just love automatic. But I would just have you to note that everything that you need and everything that I need in our life and, and I don't have time to dwell on this, I wish I did, but everything that we need in our life, everything that we need in our life or everything we want in our life is outside of our comfort zone. If it was inside your comfort zone, you'd already have it. And so COVID just took us all out of our comfort zone and the question was not did we end up somewhere that was different and certainly not automatic in life? The issue and the question is very simple. When we got out of our comfort zone, did we, did we seize that moment and, and get better or, 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 or did we drift? The second comment on COVID is that everybody was uncertain. You know, leaders love answers and leaders love to, to be able to, to kind of project and envision the future, but COVID didn't let us do that, and I, like all of you, I just said, well, I have no idea, you know. I mean, the wasn't the most popular question the first 90 days of COVID is, when is this going to be over? <laughs> and, and the only people that I knew that tried to answer that were fools. <laughs> we, we didn't know when it was going to be over. It, it, you just, you know, just I, I, you know I, I'm not sure. I've, I've never been here before. This is different. But the thing that really brings me to the teaching tonight 
is the third thought about COVID, and that is that this crisis that, that moved all of us, everybody was discovered. Everybody was revealed. You see, a, 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 you know, we hear a lot of times that a crisis makes a person. I don't think a crisis makes a person. I think that it reveals a person. I think when difficulty comes, we find out very quickly who the players are and who the pretenders are. And I can tell you from my heart, and with all fatherly love, I'm extremely leadership sad. I'm leadership sad for my country. I'm leadership sad for the world. I'm, but I'm most leadership sad for the church. And I'm leadership sad because I, I feel that we've missed an opportunity. I feel that uh, perhaps instead of rising above the crowd and leading, we became part of the crowd. So if you'll just let me just share with you and kind of just lovingly walk you through this process, I would like to do that. I, I just think that you never really know who a person is until the crisis comes, until the adversity comes. I, I was speaking literally, talking with a friend recently, and I was asking about another person that I just had met. And I asked him, I said, do you know him very well? Do you know anything about the character of the person? And I'll never forget, he looked at me and said, well, John, he said, what I know is he just seems like a wonderful person, but he said, you have to understand, I can't vouch for his character. I've not seen him under adversity yet. You see, adversity on the outside requires strength on the inside. Now, there was a, there's, when, when Chris, when you're talking about you love the old songs, okay, now we're going to get as old as the hills now. I'm going to go to an old Sunday school song. First of all, let me just do a little. How many of you went to Sunday school? Let me just, okay, yes, okay. How many of you have no clue? Okay. <laughs> In Sunday school, we used, to sing, we used to sing a song about the wise man and the foolish man. Would any of you remember this? Yes. Some of you do, you remember this? We sang it, in, especially in grade school. Do, do you even remember the motions? Yes. Oh, let's try it, let's try it. <laughs> Come on, let's try it, you know, huh? That, and, and if you don't know, it's okay, it's okay. You, some of you haven't been as fortunate as all of us. <laughs> and, and some of you are less educated and under, yeah, so that we understand. But, 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 but for you, that, that I, in fact, I, I'm not sure, I think I got it. It's been a long time, trust me. But it went something like this. I, if I remember right, we started with the wise man. And remember, he built his house on the what? On the, oh, you remember, okay, remember? So here's the way we did it. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came out. And the house on the rock stood firm. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand, and the rains came tumbling down. Come on now. The rains came down and the floods came. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up, and the house on the sound went flat. Come on, give yourself a hand. This is huge. Oh my goodness. I'll be leading worship tomorrow. <laughs> oh, Whew. just kind of feel it. I'm so happy, so many of you, I just, I just didn't, I just thought I would be singing a solo. <laughs> the passage is Luke 6. And in this passage, Jesus says some amazing things. He tells us to love our enemies. He tells us to Practice the golden rule, not to judge others, to give generously. And then he says, what's on the inside determines what's on the outside. 
He gave the story of the tree. It's on the screen. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit, and people do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And then he went to the wise and foolish builders. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. And when the flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on a ground without a foundation. And the moment that the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. It's interesting in this story that Jesus says that the people that he's comparing, the wise and the foolish, both of them hear his words. But the wise builder puts his words into practice and the foolish builder doesn't. I would say to you that too many leaders today are more concerned about the outside than the inside. And this lesson is about building, not branding. This lesson is about doing, not saying. And I want you to notice that every Thing is fine in this story until the storm comes. Listen to me. It's the storm, it's the adversity, it's the COVID that shows up what kind of a foundation that you and I have. You see, I'm asked a lot of times because I live in the business world, I'm asked by a lot, especially younger generation, about branding. I've got seven companies, we've done very well. And they'll talk to me and they'll say, John, help me, help me with branding. And, and, and I said, well, let me just help you with another thought. <laughs> Why don't you just get good? <laughs> just get good. It, it, and if you get good, any brand will work. <laughs> and if you're bad, there isn't a brand that can save you. And I love to take them into my home office when I can. I love to show them my first cassette kits when I went out and started sharing leadership and I show them to them and there were stickers on ugly cassette. I saved them because they're so bad. And in four years, 100,000 people were listening to those leadership tapes. You see, it's... It's not the branding on the outside, it's the building on the inside. I had a young guy, I was doing a conference and a couple thousand people, I was teaching leadership and he came up to me and he said, I just love what's happening today. People are loving this, they're just devouring this leadership stuff you're giving. And he said, I, I decided I would like to do what you do. I said, that's great, good for you. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, would you like to do what I did? <laughs> so you can do what I do. You see, we want to do, but we don't want to did. <laughs> and the did is the foundation. The did's the structure. The did's the core. But we don't want to did, we want to do. And we not only want to do, we want to do it now. And we want to have it now. And it's kind of like, well, oh my gosh, I've waited two months. Yeah. <laughs> We've got to change the brand. Something's happened. Here's the issue. If you don't did it, you don't get to do it. And too many people want to live in do land. (laughs) 
and they haven't spent enough time in did land. And if you don't did, did, then you don't do, do. And if you skip did, you'll be in deep doo doo. That's kind of the modern translation of what Jesus said right there. That's right out of the Maxwell Leadership Bible. In the last 18 months, too many Christian leaders have lost their way. They followed the crowd instead of leading the crowd. They moaned instead of leading. They grieved over a lost election more than they did the loss of values. And sadly, they've been cursing the darkness instead of turning on the light. Winston Churchill said, and it's on your screen because it's a great quote, in every age, there comes a time when a leader must come forward to meet the needs of the hour. Therefore, there is no potential leader who does not have an opportunity to make a positive difference in society. And when the hour is the darkness, this is our moment. So let me talk to you briefly about how to turn on the light. Jesus said we're to be salt, we're to be light. I'm gonna give you just some very simple thoughts quickly. Number one, if you really, if you really wanna turn on the light, and you really wanna lead well during dark times and you just really wanna have that solid foundation, number one, get over yourself. <laughs> My name's John, I'm your friend. <laughs> Please, get over yourself. Let me explain something to you. It's not about you. The first step in leadership is to get over yourself. The first step in connecting with people is to get over yourself. The first step in communicating is to get over yourself. I tell people all the time when they say, I want to be a great communicator. I said, number one, just get over yourself. Get over the day that you're more concerned about helping people than how you look. All of a sudden, good things begin to happen. It's, a, it's the key to serving others. It's the key to influencing others. And by the way, the get over yourself is the Maxwell translation. Jesus said, if you want to be first, you have to be last. Yes, you do. And if you want to rule, you have to serve. You want to live, you have to die. He was just saying, get over yourself. One of the reasons I love, one of the reasons I love coming to grow because it's so important and it's so clear. In fact, I said Chris to Chris today, I said, Chris, you are so clear in what you're teaching us, that it's convicting. It's very convicting. I mean, don't we wish that he was a lot more unclear? <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful we kind of left growing and said, I, I have no idea. <laughs> My gosh, it just, I just tried to follow him. He's just, woo, woo, woo. Wouldn't it be wonderful? No, no, he's so clear, it's convicting. When I was pastor in San Diego, I did a summer series on success principles in the life of the Apostle Paul. And I love the study of, because uh, he's such an incredible leader himself, so I always love reading Paul and, and that whole process. But, but when I was working on this series, I came to what I thought was the key to his success. I mean, obviously, called, anointed, uh, I mean, the, there was a spiritual dimension. But, but I think that there was something, that there was a reason that God could use him. And, and, and the secret of Paul's success is he didn't have to survive. He truly knew what it was like to get over himself. There's one scripture, he's just, we're just gonna go one, one passage in Acts 20. And here's what Paul's saying. He said, there's an urgency before me now and I feel compelled to go to Jerusalem. I'm completely in the dark about what will happen when I get there. I do know there won't be any picnic. For the Holy Spirit has let me know repeatedly and clearly that there are hard times and imprisonment ahead. Don't miss these words, but what matters, but that matters little. What matters most to me 
is to finish what God started. The job that Master Jesus gave me of letting everyone I meet know all about this incredible extravagant generosity of God. You see, Paul said, I know that when I leave you, I'm gonna be in prison. He said, I, I, it's, it's basically, he says, I know what is in front of me is very dark and very difficult. But the reason that Paul was so successful is he didn't have to survive. He'd already died. He'd already died to self. He understood what it was to be to, to be crucified with Christ. He, he understood this exchange. He, 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 and, and, and I don't want you to miss this. I mean, what are you going to do with the Apostle Paul? You say, Paul, we don't like your preaching. We're going to threaten you. And Paul's going to say, that's been done before. <laughs> Paul, if you continue on, we're going to put you in prison. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Could I go back to Philippi? You know, when I was in prison, I, the guard was almost saved when they let me out. Paul, just shut up. We're, we're going to kill you. Oh, would you please? <laughs> to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What are you going to do with the apostle Paul? Absolutely nothing. Why? He didn't have to survive. Part of our problem is Christians want to survive too much. And it breaks my heart. I never felt, I was totally surprised by many things about COVID, but I was mostly surprised about the fear factor. I would have hoped that as Christians, we could have lived above the world. I know in my world, which is the business world, it was my greatest year of witnessing and sharing my faith because when people would talk about fear, I'd just say, oh my gosh, I understand, it's pretty tough, uncertain times. Oh man, you know what I wish? What do you wish? Just between you and me. I wish you had my faith. Why? What do you have? Well, I just have a God that helps me deal with these anxieties and fears. Oh my gosh, this was the greatest year of witnessing I've ever seen because I didn't fall in the trap of being one more fearful Christian. Okay, okay. I love the applause, we just don't have time. The first thing, get over yourself. You got that one? In fact, look at your neighbor and say, get over yourself. Oh, that's so good, that's so good. This is so good. Okay, just I'm going to number two, but you got please, you gotta let me have some pleasure here. Wasn't it fun? <laughs> Looking at your neighbor and say, would you get over yourself? How many of you that was an answer of prayer? <laughs> that, I mean, I just opened the door for you've been wanting to tell that person for so long to get over themselves, and I just I'm your John the Baptist. I just open up the way. If you want to turn on the light, number two, I'll have to explain this one. Move to the center of the wheel. This is all about emotional capacity. This is all about emotional strength, the ability to handle adversity, failure, criticism, change, pressure in a very positive way. And by the way, instability. In times of stability, leaders make history. But in times of instability, history makes leaders. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. We did miss it. We had a chance to be made as leaders in the Christian community. And sadly, just sadly, some of us missed that opportunity. This has been, since 2000, we've had continual chaos. I mean, 2000 began with the Y2 bug, and then the dot-com bubble burst, then 9-11, then the corporate scandals, and I mean, I, I've got a list of whole things, I don't have time, it just, you, but I mean, we have been in continual chaos in this entire century. Are you with me? Now the question is this, 
Are we going to be emotionally strong and be a security for our people? Or are we going to get in that same stream and get swept and drifted away? Okay, I'm going to tell you a great book you want to read. Anything that, that Tom Morris writes, I write. Okay, he's a secular writer. But I do a lot of secular reading because I live in a secular world. I've got to connect. And T Tom Morris had a book called Plato's Lemonade Stand. It's a great book. You're just going to, you're going to, you're going to thank me, okay? Okay, here's what, here's what Plato says, or here's what Tom Morris says. Okay, are you ready? This is about stability. It's on your screen. Imagine life, because remember the point here. That what, what, what's the point? We're talking about emotional strength and stability. Move to the center of the wheel. Okay, here we go. Stability. Imagine life was a big wagon wheel, and if we are emotionally, if we emotionally live on the outer rim, when that wheel turns, we are spun around in extreme highs and lows in rapid and dizzying succession. But if we can learn, if we can learn to move closer to the midpoint of the hub, we become much more centered. The wheel will spin but we won't be so dramatically thrown about by its motion. So the question is very simple, how do I move to the center of the wheel? How, how, do, I, how do I get in that place where I'm not like everyone else? Three thoughts, because I've worked hard on moving to the center of the wheel. And I'm gonna give you my three questions that I asked myself that just helped me get there. My first question is, what is my definition of success? I want to encourage every one of you to get your own definition of success. So that when somebody else comes around, because success means a lot of things to a lot of people, it's very subjective. So when people come around and you're trying to be successful and you're trying to be like someone else and, and you're looking for validation from someone else, by the way, when you're looking for validation on the outside, it's because you lack strong values on the inside. That's a whole study. It's a whole huge study. And so when I was, when I, in, the, in, in the 1980s, I was in a very good p p uh, part of my life and I was pastoring. I had the 10th largest church in America and life was good and they just got done writing a book about us and, and it was pretty amazing and I was, I was writing books and things were going really good and then I was looking around and I was seeing a lot of people that I thought were successful and I saw them, their life came crashing down and so I said, I've gotta get my own definition of success and so I got it and I wrote it down and it serves me well. To me, success is very simple. Those closest to me love and respect me the most. That's my definition of success. Let me explain that to you because it's so beautiful. That's, this, this is success on the inside. This is, what, this is how you build, this is how I built my success foundation. This, was, this is where you get solid. This is where you get to the center of the world. Do not miss this. Those closest to me love and respect you the most. Can I tell you something? There's something wrong with any of us if people who don't know us well like us better. Than those who know us well. There's an amazing credibility issue. So I just said, okay, I've got to get centered in the way I'm going to get centered, the way I'm going to get to the center of the will. Is success for me is just going to be very simple, and that is those who are closest to me love and respect me the very most. That was success on the inside. That allowed me then, once the inside is right, the outside can expand. You see, our goal should not be to be bigger. My friend Truett Cathy in the Chick-fil-A Foundation, early day, years, the, the board was pushing to, to more stores, more stores. We need to get bigger, we need to get better. And Truett Cathy said, no, no, no. He said, we need to get better. He said, if we get better, the customer will demand that we get bigger. We gotta, we gotta be, which brings me to the second point, we've gotta be bigger on the inside than we are on the outside. We've got, to, we've got to be bigger on the inside than we are on the outside. You see, we all have these emotions, positive and negative, within us. And I've never been able to erase all the negative emotions in my life. I've never been able to erase fear. I, you know, when people say, well, you know, I have no fear, I just, you know, I say, and what drugs are you taking? 
I, I, I mean, I have questions, I have anxieties, I have uncertainties, are you with me? You see, the question is not do I have some negative parts of my emotional that will have a tendency to, to bring me down. The question is, I'm talking about being bigger now on the inside than the outside. I'm talking about getting to the center of that wheel. Here's the question. The question is not, do I have some fears? Do I have some questions? Do I have some anxious time? That, that isn't the question. The question is, is my faith, which is a positive emotion, stronger than my fear? Because if my faith is stronger than my fear, I will then operate as a person of faith. If my fear is stronger than my faith, I will operate as a person of fear. And the thing that has pretty much amazed me again is when I look at Christians, I say, oh my gosh, you would think that they had no God. Are, are, are you kidding me? Is, is that your best? Let me take you to C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, of course, had an incredible not only life changing ministry during World War II in, in Britain, but today he still incredibly touches our lives. So I'm going to go to an article he wrote in 1948 entitled Living in an Atomic Age. This is when the atomic bomb and the atomic age was coming and what would happen if, if a bomb was dropped. And, and these, although these words were written 73 years ago, they're as relevant today as they were then. And, and just take the atomic bomb and just substitute it for the coronavirus. It's on your screen so you can read it with me. In one way, we think a great deal too much, oh yes, of the atomic bomb. How are we to live in atomic age. I am tempted to reply, why? As you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year. Or as you would have lived in a Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night. <laughs> or indeed, as you are already living in the age of cancer, age of syphilis, age of paralysis, age of air raids, the age of railway accidents, the age of motor accidents, in other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. He just defined gross in maturity. And I am so sick and tired of listening to gross in maturity. I expect more out of leaders. I expect you not to be swept away by the emotions and the fears of others. I would expect you to stand to give security to people that are drifting. Okay, back to C.S. Lewis, he's much better than me. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented. I don't have to survive. Are you seeing the theme here? Don't miss it. And quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways and it's perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of a painful and premature death to a world which is already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all, it's a certainty. Some of you are acting like if you're fearful, you'll get out of life alive. I may lead worship tomorrow. I'm, I could break into a moon dance anytime. Don't miss it. Back to C.S. Lewis. He's never been interrupted quite like this. This is the first point to be made and the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, 
Let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children. Come on! Playing again, chatting with our friends, height and a game of darts. Come on! You don't have to go there. You don't have to be that way. You can rise above this. Not huddled. Not huddled. Together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, but they need not dominate our minds. Chris and I know that we want to, this bigger on the inside than the outside, it's all about values. I spoke of it just briefly a moment ago and the fact that if I have strong values within me, I need less validation outside of me. But we live in a culture that has not been valued and has not learned good values. And so we seek validation all the time. I didn't realize how incredible a aware I was of social media. I was way ahead of the time. I remember when I was in the third grade. <laughs> Honest to God, Wanda sat right beside me and she was so pretty. And I said, Wanda, I love you. <laughs> Do you love me? Check this box. Honest to God, what's wrong with us? I'll tell you, we don't have a foundation. We don't have the core, we don't have the values. So Chris sent this to me the other day. He said, another reason why we need values. This is good, Chris. The founder of Dubai, Sheikh Rashid, was asked about the future of his country and he replied, my grandfather rode a ca camel, my father rode a camel, I ride a Mercedes, my son rides a Land Rover, and my grandson is going to ride a Land Rover, but my great-grandson is going to have to ride a camel again. Why is that? He was asking his reply. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create easy times. Easy times create weak men. Weak men create difficult times. Many will not understand it, but you have to raise warriors, not parasites. And you have to add to that historical reality that all great empires, not some, all great empires, the Persians, Trojans, Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the British, all rose and perished within 240 years. And they were not conquered, conquered by external enemies. They rotted from within. Okay. Stay right with me. To be in the center of the wheel, we gotta ask ourselves three questions. What's my definition of success? Am I bigger on the inside than I'm on the outside? And three is, who is my source? Back to Plato's lemonade stand. He said Plato took a stand on unchanging values as the ultimate leverage that we have for grappling with this unpredictable world. He was convinced that we can attain true success in life only if we first understand the things that never change and use them well as our reference points for moving forward productively through life's uncertainties. This is a secular writer and he says centuries later, Jesus of Nazareth talked about building the structure of your life on a solid foundation of unyielding rock rather on shifting sands that provide no support. Skip the rest of it. I mean, a little bit of a time crunch, but I've got to do this because it works. I had an incredible, incredible spiritual, life-changing experience during COVID. And I would take my walks every day. Why was I taking walks? Because I wasn't traveling. 
I wasn't speaking anywhere. And I'd read Psalm 112. Praise the Lord for all who trust in God, who are blessed beyond expression. And when darkness overtakes him, light will come bursting in, into him. And such a man will not be overthrown by evil circumstances. Don't miss this. God's constant care of him will make a deep impression on all who see it. And I would walk and I'd say, I want your constant care of me to make a deep impression on all who see it. And I don't want to get down there drifting with the rest of them in this incredible fear issue and them not see the difference between a person of faith and a person of fear. Listen to these words. He does not fear bad news nor live dread and dread of what may happen. Why? For it is settled in his mind that God will take care of him. Come on now. God's going to take care of you. I'd read that every day as I would take my walk. One last closing thing. Sorry. Give me two more minutes. We need to begin with the end in mind. We not only need to move to the center of the will and get over ourselves, but we need to begin with the end in mind. The seven habits of highly successful people, Stephen Covey just teaches us habit number two, before you can live a meaningful life, you've got to know what it looks like. Another person I read all the time is David Brooks. There are just certain authors you just need to read all the time. And he had a great book called The Road to Character, and he talks about two kind of virtues, resume virtues and eulogy virtues. Resume virtues is what I show when I want employment and I want to impress somebody. Here's what I've done and this is who I am and, and would you hire me? And, and that's what, a, we know what a resume virtue is, but he said a eulogy virtue, he said that's much deeper. He said that's who you really are. That's the core of your being. So I've tried to live my life with the end in mind. Several years ago, I decided that I wanted to finish well, and on my iPhone, several years ago now, I wrote these words. It'll come on your screen. I will be bigger on the inside than the outside. Character matters. I will follow the golden rule. People matter. I will value humility above all virtues. Perspective matters. I will, have, I will travel the high road of life because attitude matters. I will teach only what I believe. Passion matters. I will reach people for Christ. Souls matter. I will daily develop myself, growth matters. I'll be salt and light, evangelism matters. I will finish well, faithfulness matters. And I'll play the infinite game, legacy matters. I'm done. I lied, I'm not dead. <laughs> how, how could I be done teaching this lesson to you beautiful people without like a father praying over you and blessing you? Now, tonight when you leave my latest book, Change Your World, it's all for you free. I wanted to give you one. So I just, yeah.
And, and I, I want you to have it. This is a new thought for some of you so that you'll read it. <laughs> and if you don't mind me pushing the envelope, if you read it, it will change your life. This book, this book tells you how to change the world that you live in. But I'd be so honored to pray over you. So let's just do that and then I'm done. Thank you, Father, for uh, the opportunity first to be able to speak and grow. It's, it's amazing that my friend Chris would let me do this and I'm grateful for his kindness to me. And here's what I know. There are people in this room who really love you and they really want to make a difference and they really want to have a solid foundation and they really want to be bigger on the inside than they are on the outside and they want to swim upstream and not drift and they want to show the world that the source our faith our god is greater than that is in the world and I just pray over them right now in the name of Jesus that you would just do a special work in their life, a special work that would allow them to, at this very moment, begin to take faith and, and, and let faith be stronger than fear and, and, and determine to do well now so that they can finish well later. And Father, for all of us that have drifted and shifted, forgive us and, and, and you're the great restorer. You're the, you're, you're the great forgiver. You bring us back. And, and so that's what I ask. But more than anything else, Father, I pray that as, as we leave tonight, we will have a determination that for us to live is Christ, to die is gain. And this world has no hold on us. Oh, no hold on us. We are yours. We are redeemed by you. We are your chosen people. We are called by you. You. You're our source. There is no other. And if he's your source now, I want you just to tell heaven how much you love him and how much you're going to him. He's your source. He's your 